Okay, okay, we got another any news Mushoku Tensei content. The true danger of Rudius's journey to save Zenith. The true danger? What was the true danger? Was it cheating on her wife with her grandma-in-law? Was it cucking Cliff? Let's see what he has to say. Journey to Begarit felt fast in comparison to his other travels, then you'd be right to think that since what would normally be two episodes was condensed into half of one. This I'm a big fan of that. Imagine we had two episodes of just traveling. I think that some things needs to get expedited in order to focus on the meat. And if those traveling scenes were actually impactful to the story and offered like really important plot details, then yeah, it should be covered. But like, was it that important? It's included seven full days of nonstop monster encounters, then an additional two weeks with a whole new set of characters and even an action filled ambush with bandits. Unfortunately, <laughs> wait, that's the guy from Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Is, is, isn't this the American dude from Yu-Gi-Oh? That like says some shit like, hey, we don't like your kind around here to a bunch of Japanese people, but they're like in Japan. And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, what did he say? He's like, even Japan's American or something, right? I forget. He was hilarious. There's something like so just blatantly American racist about it. And he was like, y'all Japanese, this is American territory. But it's like, but we're in Japan. It's Unfortunately, finishing the Labyrinth arc meant setting those parts aside though, so I hope you're alright with settling- Yo, look at the Labyrinth arc. Look, hold on. I hope you're- oh, Wait, go back, go back, go back a little bit. Okay, let's look at the- So you got Paul and Rudy. You got Roxy. You got Geese over here. Can Geese fight? I've never- Geese isn't really a fighter, right? I don't know. He's just- I don't, I don't know. What's the monsters around? What are these like- There's like these armored- I'm not sure what kind of monsters these are, but they're like shelled and armor. We got Eddie and Eze, and we have the dwarf over there too, yeah. Those parts aside though, so I hope you're alright with settling with my video instead. I'll okay. go through the true adventure Rudy and Alina Lise faced while crossing the desert, along with the left out details from the events leading up to it. So, but as first, we go through what we missed from this wait, wait, wait. transitionary episode, hopefully you'll enjoy more what this amazing story has to offer. But first, before we get started, Mugen merch incoming very quickly before i get started though oh that's a new one very quickly before i get started i gotta remember that into my repertoire but first before we get started very quickly before we get started i'm sure you're aware of the mishoku tensei new beginning too good yes yeah, I, I sniffed that shit out guys go over to his shop and buy the mishoku tensei honestly which merch would i buy here i personally would not buy like let's look at like this i personally would not buy like anime like like i don't know going out in public with just like huge anime girls on your shirt i i like it when it's more like minimalistic so like this shirt this is a cool design this is a pretty cool design i don't really like like writings i i, I it's i i just like it blank something like super minimalistic it's nice the t-shirts this this is a cool design though i i do like this design the black I don't know what's happening here. I think those are like red clouds. The Goddess of War Aerith shirt, honestly, maybe? I don't know. Like, it'd be kind of cringe if I went out around just having the Goddess of War with Aerith's face there, but it's, it's better than like the hentai t shirt where it's just like girls just doing full on fucking Nahegao with, you know, and it's just the entire t shirt is just like that, right? Maybe the Aerith one I might get. Maybe the new sweatpants or even the three pack of stickers you can check them all out using the store link down in the description but anyway anyway episode 43 desert journey covering chapters 8 to 12 from volume 11 of the light novel to start things off with rudy coming to terms with his decision this would be the first time that he'd ever not listened to the man god and we gonna regret it we are gonna pay for this shit one way or the other he wasn't just ignoring oh wait what am i doing there you go. ...the advice he was given though, but instead taking it a step further and doing the exact opposite of what he recommended. It was a pretty big deal when he really thought about it, since if he'd done the same and didn't go to Sharonay when the man god told him to, then Lilia and Aisha would still be captives there. <laughs> Damn, he would have dark. never met Aisha and wouldn't have run into Orsted, and while sure the journey to Fatoa would have been easier, he probably wouldn't have heard the truth about Lilia and Aisha for years. They just died? That was one of the regrets he would have had to deal with, so it was likely the regrets he'd experience in Begarit were going to be similar. There was- 
What kind of regret is it going to be? The most interesting thing is how the human God said, if you go to Begare, you will regret it. Therefore, you should abandon your parents and just stay home and fuck one of the cat girls or the dog girls and cheat on your wife. That is the optimal path and you won't regret it. What does that really mean, though? It almost sounds like if we go to beggar it, either the outcome won't change and we'll have left behind our wife and, you know, the, <clears throat> the birth of our child, maybe, and stuff like that. But on top of that, <clears throat> maybe because Rudy shows up, someone dies. Think about that, right? Maybe because Rudy is there, something even worse could happen. So either the outcome doesn't change or Rudy being there makes it even worse. That's the only way that we're going to regret it if we went, right? There was no telling what they'd actually be, but Rudy could imagine something as bad as losing a limb or even a parent. I am fully, fully prepared to either lose Paul or Zenith or both. Like some people are definitely going to die. The stakes has never been so high. I fully think that Paul and Zenith definitely could die. Maybe Paul would die trying to sacrifice himself to save Zenith. Maybe the vice versa. Maybe... I don't think Geese would die. I don't think Roxy would die either. Erina Rize is kind of sus recently. Especially because of Erina Rize and Paul about how they have a grudge and Erina Rize won't let Paul apologize no matter what. And, and she won't accept it no matter what. But imagine how impactful it would be if it's like Paul's deathbed. He's about to die and that's the only moment that Erina Rize will be able to, you know, give him the apology. Like the accept the apology. I think that would be a very impactful scene. So those three characters, Erina Rize, Paul Zenith... Anyone else? Rudy's not gonna die. Roxy, I don't think so. The dwarf, you don't really know much about him, so I don't really have any you know, stakes with him. This was all part of the risk he was taking by going on this journey, but even that was better than waiting for years wondering what actually happened in Begarit. So Rudy would meet up with Elena Lise to tell her his decision, and it's here we find out how it is he was convinced Geese's letter wasn't just an overreaction. I mean, both him and Alina Lise knew he was the type of person to overreact, but if you looked closer at- I'm not gonna lie, Geese actually looks like a monkey, right? Like, it was the type- He's like a monkey hybrid, right? Right? He's always had, like, the, like the nose, like, the, the head, like, like, Geese is, like, straight up monkey human, right? He is. Like, like, not, not an insta- like, literally monkey human. He is, right? ...type of person to overreact, but if you looked closer at the circumstances behind how the letter got there, the only way that was possible... The fuck his name is Monkey? Why is his name not fucking Monkey? Like, why is it Geese? Is that a goose? Ain't nothing about him that looks like a goose. Geese is plural for goose. The, f the fuck is he? Why is he named Geese when he He's a monkey? He's not a half Geese, half human? ...possible was if Paul gave Geese his address. This made it clear that the two had met up already, so that ruled out the possibility of Geese trying to rescue Zenith Solo. Why was it that Paul didn't send the letter himself then? Well, whether it be stubborn pride or something deeper, he clearly didn't want to involve Rudy in something he was responsible for. So pride. Then there was always the fact Express Mail wasn't cheap either, so that alone was a big indicator things were serious too. Now, there was a cutscene after this where Alina Lise and Rudy would be planning their route together, but considering the teleportation made all that irrelevant, the biggest issue aside from that was choosing what to bring and how to keep up with Alina Lise. I mean, Rudy was definitely fit and capable of making the journey, but when compared to the veteran experience of Alina Lise, he really was nothing more than an amateur. Really? It was a gap in skill that made him worried he'd actually slow her down a bit. I didn't have that feeling at all in the anime, but it, it, the, the, the Erina Rize glazing here from Annie News, it must be real. The other problem was Alina Lise's Horny. curse, since as I'm sure you know, her not sleeping with someone means she'll die. On casual journeys, this wasn't much of an issue, but on a rapid expedition where breaks were minimal, finding a willing partner was definitely going to be difficult. How does she get dick? No, then we found like a nearby village, like an oasis, right? Because she just went in the desert. It's like, I'm going to go find someone. I'm like, how the fuck are you just going to summon a dick right now? Enough that Rudy figured they'd have to make time to find brothels on the way. This was a core part of their journey that the anime only briefly touched on. And as you'll soon see once we talk about it later, Alina Lise's curse became more of a pressing issue the longer they traveled for. Now, it was right after this conversation that Rudy would escort Alina Lise to Cliff, since if she was going to preserve her relationship with him, then it was best she talked to him sooner than later. So, Rudy would ask Cliff if he'd love her no matter what, and it was after that that he'd explain why she'd have to leave him for a bit. 
Of course, mentioning how sleeping with other men was an unfortunate necessity to it, which was something Cliff surprisingly didn't say a word to. Uh, Cliff has got to be the most cucked character in Mushoku Tensei, but he's such a good kid. I feel bad. I don't know. He's just too much of a good person, man. He simply sat there listening to what Rudy had to say, not once interrupting him until he was finished. It was once everything was fully explained. Like, like Cliff is straight up dating a porn star. There's nothing wrong with being a sex worker. But like, if you get your feelings in the way and you're not okay with your partner, you know, going out getting fucking back shots every other night. Uh, and he comes from like a religious like background too. Like, I feel for Cliff, man. Explained after that, Cliff didn't even ask if he could go along with them. Since he already knew how much of a burden he'd turn out to be, both him and Alina Lise knew that he'd never make it. <laughs> That's right. Cliff just doesn't have the stamina for it. Damn, girl, also in bed too? So instead, the only thing he could do was sit there and grit his teeth. A display of emotional maturity that had Rudy actually feeling bad for Cliff. He could tell that Cliff was definitely hurting, but the fact he held his tongue showed Cliff had a clear understanding of what he could and couldn't do. Cucked. Something not very many people were capable of. Cliff would then say all that stuff about wanting to get married, and Alina Lise's reaction to that was to push him over and start doing it right there. In public? Literally outside a door. She just jumped on him. Oh, they skipped that in the anime. Oh. Naturally, Rudy would leave as fast as possible, and that brings us now to his goodbyes with these Okay, two. then! Before getting into how this could very well be the last time we see these two in a while, though, Rudy first mentioned how someone told him he should make a move on them. <laughs> a notion you may be surprised to know that both had actually shown a bit of excitement towards. Linnea in person is always so happy about that. What the fuck is the man got looking so happy down here, bro? Look at him. <laughs> Well, Linnea Person thinks Might is right, so Rudy is so powerful, he's a big boss, so it's like probably Linnea and Person's wish to get, you know, birth a child by a big boss to have a strong kid, right? This made Rudy consider how acting on it would turn out, since if the man god's words really were to be trusted, then he could expect Sylphie not to be mad at all. She definitely wouldn't kick him out of the house, and just like with all things the man god advised him on, it should, in the end, lead him to greater happiness overall. Should. It was an alluring idea since Rudy couldn't help but think what a potential foursome would be like, but- The idea of a harem had a certain appeal. I found myself picturing a foursome with Linnea Persna and Sylphie. Right on my man. <laughs> right on my man. <laughs> that was something he knew was best left to the imagination. Now, okay. the goodbye was far more permanent than what we got in the anime since, with Rudy still operating under the assumption the journey would take two years, that meant by the time he came back, Linnea and Persena would be graduated. They would more than likely be back in the Great Forest, so unless Rudy went out of his way to see them there, this would be the last time him or us would see these two Aww. in quite a while probably. If anything, Rudy imagined it could be something like 10 or 20 years before he saw them again. I wonder when we're going to see them again. What plot reasons do we have to see Persona and Linnea again? I don't think there really is any if we just like end up graduating. Well, we can teleport. I don't know, even know how many years of school they have left. Assuming we resolve everything, we can just teleport back in time to, you know, for the birth of Rudius Jr. Then we should be able to see them again. But I just feel like that's not going to happen. It's not going to be that simple. We're not going to be there for the birth of our child. Moving on to the scene with Nanahoshi. If you're wondering whether or not she's supposed to have this type of information, the likely and most probable answer is no. The very knowledge of teleporters was supposed to remain secret, so I doubt Orsted would want maps of them floating around anywhere. How was it that Nanahoshi was able to procure these maps then? Well, she had secretly bought maps whenever they were in a city, then marked the general locations of where she was going and oh, what teleporters naughty. they had used in the area. So even Orsted there doesn't know? To buy, then Nenahoshi would create her own using rough drawings and markings. So they, she did this without Orsted knowing? Basic notation identified the cities and continents that okay. she was traveling through, then oh, variables were used for the ones that she didn't know. All in all, it was a rough record of every teleporter she passed through, but given she had to create it without Orsted even knowing, I'd say the results were rather impressive. It allowed Rudy to estimate that getting to Begarit would take 47 days only. Add in one extra month to save Zenith, then the whole round trip would be something more like four months. Four months. This made Rudy excited to go tell Alina Lise, so he would rush back to where he just left her and Cliff, then barge in to see the two pretty much naked. Oh. Cliff was passed out in the corner looking like he'd just... <laughs> this is the first time we actually see them in action, bro. This, 
<laughs> Cliff has just got his soul. It's going to heaven right now, bro. It's been sucked dry. Look at him. Had the life sucked out of him, and Alina Lise was circling the room trying to come up with excuses why she couldn't go anymore. For some reason, whatever she just did with Cliff was enough to change her mind and make her not want to go anymore. She is an emotional fucking roller coaster. Oh my god, bro. I'm, uh... Why are you doing that? Like, you're, you're... That, that's crazy. That is insane. That, 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 that is, that is, that is, you show up to a stream to literally spoil. You gotta be the dumbest motherfucker. You have actually gotta be one of the dumbest motherfuckers to ever exist, bro. Literally never watch my content again. Please go end yourself in a video game. Fuck you. Holy shit. You gotta be actually so dumb. You have to be so stupid, so attention craving to show up to a stream to talk about a different video to spoil on that when you know I don't want spoilers. Like, that's insane. That's actually insane. These are the monkeys that I have to deal with on a day to day basis. Do you understand why my mental fortitude is fucking a roller coaster? Why I yell so much? Because I have to deal with monkeys like this on a fucking daily basis, but it is what it is. And the content continues. She couldn't bear the thought of having to leave him for two whole years like that. It was only after Rudy revealed it would actually be something more like four months that Alina Lise would change her mind again. Now, a four-month journey was definitely way more manageable for Cliff, but because it was unlikely that he could keep the teleporters a secret, Rudy figured it was best to keep him behind this time. If things did somehow turn out so bad that they needed even more reinforcements though, then Rudy thought they could just teleport back and bring even more people. Would it be that simple? It was back home with Sylphie that things were pretty much the same, but we did get to see the types of names that Rudy had in mind for his kids. It was Ciel and Sion for if it was a girl, then Nero and Wallachia for a boy. Ciel, Sion, Nero. I like Nero. Ner Wallachia. Wallachia. Oh, that's a fun name to say. I like Nero the most here, but Wallachia. But it's going to be Rudy Jr., right? If we don't show up in time. All references to Melty Blood, which to Rudy on second thought probably wasn't the best idea. Melty Blood. Looks like anime. I don't really know what that is. Is this an anime fighting game? Melty... I'm not sure, actually. I, I don't... It's a it is a fighting game. Got it, got it, okay. This is um OG actual, like, anime weep shit, got it. What he came up with after was something a bit more normal like Sirius or Lucy. As for why naming <laughs> them before leaving was such a death flag, it all stemmed from that childhood story with Perugius. You see, one of Perugius's- is, is that how you actually say his name? Perugius? I thought it was Perugius. That's what the Japanese say, it, right? Perugius. I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to pronounce names anymore. Because like the anime will say something, but it's like the Japanese way of saying something. And any normal person would probably call, you know, like... I, I don't know. Perugius. Should we start calling him Perugius? Or Perugius? His companions decided to name his unborn son before leaving for war and... Whoa, 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 whoa. You see, one of Perugius's companions decided to name his unborn son before leaving for war and... One of Perugius's companions, not himself. Okay, unborn son before leaving for Despite war. the man's nickname being Fortunate Man... His skills as an emperor tier fire mage wasn't enough oh. to beat the demon king Reiner Kaisel. Oh, I don't show up. Whoa, 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 a lot of lore here. Okay, it's like emperor tier flame magic, but there's a demon king back in the name named Reiner Kaisel, okay? So, unfortunately, Anos. this fortunate man died before meeting his son, and it became a well-known story which brought a lot of superstition with it. Well, shit, that's unlucky as fuck. That's why you shouldn't name a kid. Okay, the and his nickname was Fortunate Man. But he's unfortunate that he met the Demon King Reiner Geisel. Okay. One that most people believed to be a curse. Fast forward now to the day of travel, and the route Rudy planned was pretty much this. After finding the ruins and using the teleporter, they'd spend a week heading north getting to Bazaar, then once there, find a guide and hire them as an escort to Rapong. The toughest part was actually that initial one-week journey, since not only did Rudy not have a map guiding them to Bazaar, but Nanahoshi mentioned how the route was incredibly exhausting. 
so much so that she actually had to be carried by Orsted when she was traveling Piggyback? herself. Piggyback Luckily, Orsted? Alina Lise was confident in her innate elven sense of direction, so getting lost wasn't something either would have to worry about. It was kind of like a special ability which let her traverse unfamiliar terrain with ease. What? This was exemplified clearly in the forest, since what Rudy estimated would take two days at least, Alina Lise was able to do in only half. So she's like, got some kind of crazy skill passive, where it's like peak navigator. You're adventuring around, and she just knows the most optimal path, the safest and optimal path to get there, okay? Despite this being a dense woodland where even the best rangers were known to get lost, somehow Alina Lise knew exactly where to find these ruins. Does she also know where to find Dick? Where, she, where to find the young men that she preys on? It was while doing so that the two would proceed in their standard adventurer formation, and that was basically Alina Lise scouting in front and Rudy supporting from the back. Whatever monsters were spotted in the distance were immediately dispatched by Rudy before they could even realize that the two of them were there. It was an extremely efficient method of traversal that minimized any and all- This is such a cute way of to killing the boars here. I feel bad for these boars, because all the characters are in chibi mode right now. I feel terrible. It's so cute and terrible at the same time. All danger around them. It was once they had finally found the ruins after that the symbol marking its location could be identified as the Dragon Gods. It was rather similar to the one he found in the basement, but upon closer inspection, you can tell that it's actually different. Perhaps mm -hmm. a representation of a different- It is slightly different. It is. Why? Different dragon or connection of the Dragon God to whoever made the robot, but to me this other symbol seemed more representative of a phoenix. Either way, Phoenix. since the way the stone worked seemed very Phoenix. similar to that of a magic implement, Rudy figured breaking it open would reveal the same complex magic circles as the ones from any other magic tool. Okay. The incantation seemed part of a bigger spell as well, so Rudy wondered if learning the full one would grant him the Oh yeah, this will grant him the what? ...ability to dispel barriers of any kind. The worm lives only for his ideals. None could escape the reach of his mighty arms. He was the second to die. A dragon general. Scales green and gold. His life the most ephemeral of dreams. In the name of the holy dragon, Emperor Shirad, I break his seal. This is so cool and lower packed. Emperor Shirad. Dragon Emperor. What do we know so far? We know Dragon God. Who is Orsted. There's Dragon Emperor Shirad, but there's also like different generations as different titles held by different people, right? Or is it like an infinite thing? Yeah, there's Dragon King Perugius, but also the Demon King mentioned earlier today, don't we have... Bodyguardi is the current Demon King, and Demon Emperor is the Lolly. And Demon God is Laplace. So these titles could vary from generations. Is that correct? I mean, as a spell most likely created by the Dragon God himself, Rudy was eager to try and learn more about it. Unfortunately, any additional research would There's multiples? anger Orsted, oh. so avoiding that was priority over everything. Rudy and Delina Lise would then approach the ruins like they would a labyrinth, mainly because the entrance to it seemed very familiar to one. This included clearing each room like it was a tactical <laughs> FPS game, then carefully okay. taking each step so as to not trigger any floor traps. It was basically Alina Lise in front leading the way, and Rudy at the back supporting with his eye of foresight. Of course, there wasn't anything to worry about other than Orsted since- <laughs> Orsted's clothing. He just has a fresh pair of the same clothing in every closet. Is there also a shower nearby? Because what, he just teleports and then he's like, all right, new fresh drip. Someone was even writing like erotic fucking roleplay of like how Orsted was showing out of a fucking shower dripping with sweat as Rudy opened the closet with Orsted's clothing here. What the fuck is going on, bro? Surround the ruins were footsteps clearly belonging to him. It made Rudy worried he could show up at any second, but given the unlikelihood of such an occurrence, see him again. he knew such worries were mostly unwarranted. It did, however, bring up the question of what they should do about their own footsteps, since if Orsted's could be seen, then theirs probably would too. Rudy thought maybe he should just leave a note or something, but that would only guarantee that Orsted knew he was there. The alternative was to just do nothing, and that was what felt best since there was a chance or Should have fucking taken his clothing, bro. Just like stole that shit. Orsted would never find out he was here. 
There was no telling when Orsted would ever come back to these ruins, so surely the passage of time would cover up their presence for them. Now, teleportation felt something like waking up from a nap, and though the entire process seemed as if it was instant, the delay between jumps was more like 7 minutes or so. Okay. Rudy had waited for Alina Lise for 15 minutes in total, so that meant there was a travel time seven of 7.5 and and a half minutes. It was a phenomenon corroborated by the teleportation incident back in Fatoa, since the people affected by that reported odd delays between when they disappeared and reappeared. Another feat that stood out about this teleportation was the way the magic circle kept itself active all the time. It appeared ready to go no matter what the circumstances How was it were, and that made Rudy wonder where it was getting its power from. Good there question. didn't seem to be any magic crystals nearby powering it, so the only thing he could- It's like cloud computing. Instead of having infrastructure here, you have infrastructure in the cloud, and you can just constantly have this, um, there's a proxy server running these circles. Think of was that it was absorbing mana from the air, or getting powered from something underneath it. Either way, whatever feat of magic was allowing this circle to stay continuously active was invaluable information Rudy definitely wanted hmm. to know about. I wonder if there's like underground shit or if there was like a fucking server somewhere else that's like powering all these teleportation circles like in a, like a remotely somehow. Now, this is the point where the anime starts to speed things up since a journey which could have been one entire episode was instead condensed down to seven Thank minutes God. of seemingly standard adventure stuff. Thank God! In reality, there was a lot more encounters with monsters and even two extra chapters involving new characters and an ambush by bandits. The hmm. I mean, Frieden does that shit, right? Frieden is all- but, but Frieden is not about getting to the end goal. It's about just enjoying the journey and, the, and like, just traveling is part of the, the core content of Frieden. But Mushoku Tensei, I think a lot of people will be upset if you introduce Turning Point 3 after fucking around for 19 episodes or some shit. And finally, we're out of the school. No more slice of life, rom-com bullshit. And we're getting back into the action. And then they pulled... An entire episode of just traveling? I wonder how people would feel about that. The whole point was to bring up Rudy's mindset when it came to killing, and pretty much highlight how when fighting people, that was never really an option for him. It was kind of like its own consolidated side story similar- <laughs> This green haired dude died so quick and I didn't even know his name! Oh my god, where's Sarah? Sarah's right over there. We, Rudy's head is covering Sarah right now. Oh my god, that poor girl, dude. We destroyed her. Similar to that of Rudy's adventures with Counter Arrow. I won't be going in depth into those chapters right now, but what you need to know is Kirito and the Black Cat Guild in Season 1, SAO, or Rudy and Counter Arrow. Which was more tragic outcome? Probably Kirito, right? Like, let's get real. Everyone fucking died. <laughs> One dude fucking jumped off a bridge after coming back home and realizing they all died. <laughs> yeah, Kirito's probably... Yeah, I mean, Counter Arrow, it was pretty bad too, but yeah. It was how Rudy's journey was broken up into two legs. The first was the one-week trek from the ruins to the Oasis Town Bazaar, and the second was the two-week expedition from Bazaar to Rapan. The what is this beast? Huh? What kind of skeleton? Cause like this is clearly the rib cages and like a spine of a beast, right? What kind of monster would have you know created this, huh? A behemoth? I don't even know what that is, but it's pretty fucking huge. The anime combined both together to get through things faster, and in the process removed that second leg involving the new characters and bandits. There was quite a bit left out from the first leg too, and that's pretty much what I'll be focusing on now. Okay. So, the first night was spent staying in the ruins. Rudy wasn't sure how cold the desert got at night, and with the sun clearly getting close to setting, he figured it was best to wait it out and find out while they still had shelter. It was that same night that the incident mm. with the succubus would happen, and this would be Rudy's wake-up call to be more careful. You see, with the last few years being spent in a safe and civilized university town, Rudy realized his senses were nowhere near what they used to be. He'd clearly gotten too comfortable living oh, we the got way rusty. he had, and We're now washed. his experience as an adventurer wasn't as refined as it used to be. So, getting more in tune was definitely proving to be a challenge, but more than anything it was the terrain and weather. Luckily, Alina Lise was handling all the directions, but even just keeping up was proving to be a challenge for him. He'd wanted to create a rainstorm and make things easier, but with every monster always looking for water, doing that would just result in them getting surrounded. 
monsters here did have a weakness to cold though, so if they ever did find themselves weakness in a situation like that, Rudy knew he could just freeze the air around them and capitalize on their susceptibility to that. Another solution for the heat that Rudy came up with instead was to create pockets of cold air and decrease the temperature around him. It's like a fucking portable AC with this magic. Is there no reason why he can't just create water out of thin air? Right? How do, I, I, I don't know the mechanics of how the magic works. Because, like, if water magic is taking nearby humidity condensation from the atmosphere and then extracting it and gathering it into one place, then you're not really creating water from thin air, right? You're borrowing droplets and combining. But he should be able to just create it, right? Just like how he created pockets of heat in Renoa, Rudy was just doing the opposite and cooling things down instead. Okay. It did only decrease the temperature by about 5 degrees Celsius. That is nuts. 50 degrees Celsius, even 45 degrees Celsius. That was the peak of the heat dome in Vancouver where I live back in two years ago, I think. That was utter hell, bro. With no air conditioning. I can't believe how I fucking lived through that. It was fucking crazy. Did the conversion to Fahrenheit, you'll realize how crazy this is. And then there's gonna be motherfuckers living in the fucking desert saying, like, Oh, that's like the winter for me, shut the fuck up. Though, so while it did make things a bit more manageable, it was still brutally hot to the point that fatigue was constantly creeping up on him. Only after freezing his canteen and putting it under his robe did Rudy find the journey became a bit more tolerable. Alina Lise, on the other hand, didn't seem phased at the slightest, and Rudy believed that was probably because of her battle aura. In any case, the battle aura. This is the armament. It's like coating yourself with something. That's what Orsted once mentioned about why aren't you using magic to coat your outer body with this like aura to money. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that shit. I remember. So that would help even withstand the heat? Really? O okay. First monster they would come across would be the scorpion, and this was a creature comparable to the monsters in the demon continent. B rank. It was a not so pleasant surprise given how everyone always said the demon continent was more dangerous, but perhaps the area they were in was just especially dangerous. The next monster was significantly easier, Ooh. and this was a simple spiky green cactus treant. A minor threat due to its ability- oh, Okay, the picture that Annie just used was looking a lot more threatening, but this isn't actually it, no. ...ability to shoot needles and use earth magic, but aside from that, it wasn't very challenging. After that was a giant sandworm, and while yes it was Shai big enough Hulud. to swallow him and Alina Lise whole, they weren't very hard to deal with since Rudy could just turn the sand they were hiding in into a blender. That's right. Through skillful manipulation of the sand, sand around into the worm, blender? he was able to harden it into blades, then turn it around them and shred them to pieces. Oh. Quite a creative way of dealing with them if you ask me, and one I'm surprised he just doesn't use for every enemy they come across. That's the next crazy. monsters were by far the most dangerous, and these were a massive army of phalanx Solo ants. leveling! It was a line of thousands spreading across the horizon, Jeju Island they were well known to eat anything and everything they came across. Man, when is solo leveling season 2 coming back? Did they announce a date? They gave a season 2 announcement. It's in production, but there's no date, right? Shit. Well, it's obviously not coming this coming season. So maybe we can anticipate uh, fall this year, which is probably not going to happen. Maybe winter next year? I don't know. M maybe winter next year or some shit. By themselves, they weren't very powerful at all, but as a group, they were easily an S rank threat. Their insatiable appetite meant they'd consume anything, and as a mutated version of the less threatening army ants, they were easily the most ferocious predator currently out here. So, whether they were dealing with stray dragons or humans, these ants could surround anything with their massive numbers, then eventually overcome them no matter how powerful. Ants are the biggest threat in the desert, That's huh? why Alina Lise knew it was best to just hide from them, and that's exactly what they did for over an hour. It was while they waited that Rudy would actually try to figure out a way to beat them, but no matter what he came up with, it just didn't seem effective enough. A massive nuke would likely cause crossfire, and something that didn't kill all of them at once would just result in them getting surrounded. So, for now it seemed as if this was an enemy perhaps Rudy couldn't beat. No one can it beat these goddamn ants. Not in soul leveling. Yet another Not in Mushoku. And this time its approach was slightly different. It had used giant bats to form a wall and separate Alina Lise, Zubat. then took that opportunity to approach Rudy while he was isolated. No, no, is this Zubat? Zubat is the non-evolved form. Which one is this? Zubat evolves to? Golbat. Gol- Holy shit, my Pokemon knowledge is fucking non-existent. Golbat. 
Luckily, Rudy was able to set off a stone cannon before she got too close, but because of her resemblance to that of a human, he couldn't find it in him to use full power. At the last second, he dialed it back and, in the end, hit her with a non-lethal attack. Alina Lise would finish her off instead, and once again, Rudy would have to detoxify himself from the succubus's poisons. <laughs> succubus's poison. I love how he just, like, placed the chastity belt, like, on his dick. It's like, it's not even using it for Alina Lise anymore. Bro was using it. What did he say? You want to do something dirty with me or something? And Alina Lise, like, teased him about that, right? You want to get dirty? You want to you wanna get it on? Unlike how last time Alina Lise was able to restrain herself from Rudy's advances, though, it seemed her willpower was starting to crumble a bit. Uh oh She was quite clearly getting flustered by what Rudy was doing, and that was indication that they needed to find a brothel soon. <laughs> Let's get dirty, rizzed her up that hard! Shortly after, they would then be attacked by Velociraptors, and this was a battle which brought to the attention of Garudas. Wait, dinosaurs exist? Actual Velociraptors? That, that, that. I shouldn't be surprised that dinosaurs exist, right? Because, like, what? We just fucking had a sh bunch of army of ants. We had, like, a giant sandworm. There's, like, a cacti monster. There's a desert succubus. But something about a dinosaur is, like, they should have only existed in ancient prehistoric times, but I guess Mushoku Tensei world, it doesn't really operate the same way. Velociraptors exist, bro? Garudas. Giant chickens, I imagine, are similar to Philo, and also the natural predators Philo. to these raptors. Uh, Tatsu no Yusha. would use the chaos to slip away from the fight, which was pretty good timing since she also sensed that something bigger was coming their way. A big so, dick? all in all, this was every monster they came across on day one. That's it was cool. a relentless onslaught that made the demon continent seem like a cakewalk. Sure, the monsters there were far more powerful, but while traveling with Rijerd, they were never attacked this much. I mean, what Rudy did today felt like a week over there. The second day brought with it even more monsters, and there was actually an incident where Rudy got swallowed by a sandworm. Whoa, what is this art? God damn, this is epic, bro. This isn't Dune, right? I don't think it is. No, it's not. It was caught off guard while fighting a scorpion, and this gave the worm the opportunity to get the jump on him. Luckily, he was able to cast magic from within the worm, and this allowed him to crawl out after killing it from the inside. Unfortunately, Rudy getting swallowed also broke Alina Lise's concentration, and this resulted in her getting poisoned by the scorpion. <gasps> no! So it was a near-death experience for both of them, did, but- Did we, we have to suck the poison out of Alina Lise, you know? And like, spit it out, you know? I don't know if that actually works, but you know how that works, right? Someone gets bit, and then someone has to suck the blood, and it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a little erotic. That was simply a matter of being unlucky, not unexperienced. Later that day was when they saw the Behemoth too, and this was a peaceful giant that only attacked when attacked first. Oh, it was quite the anomaly chill. in terms of presence and behavior, since despite their size, no one has ever found one of their corpses before. Someone mentioned that the village before, right? That the huge village with bones surrounding it was behemoths, but if he's saying there's never seen the corpse before, then that is clearly not the behemoth then, right? There was a group of adventurers that said they had managed to kill one, but that was only a rumor making it seem like it was possible. No one was actually sure whether that was true or not, but Alina Lise believed that if anyone could do it, like a myth. it was probably Rudy. Day 3 was when they encountered their first sandstorm, but what Rudy initially thought was just a regular weather phenomenon, instead seemed more like a barrier due to its unnatural properties. The first was the way it acted like a stationary wall of sand, and the second was how after he'd cleared it via magic, it had returned less than an hour later exactly where it was before. Who's causing this? It made him think that this was perhaps some sort of natural looking defense that blocked the route to Orsted's ruins. It was from this point on that the monsters they encountered were far less dangerous and frequent, so days 4 and 5 dealt mainly with griffins. By now, Alina Lise couldn't control herself at all though, so when Rudy had held her as they ascended to the top of the cliff face, the very yeah. act of him touching her unleashed everything she was trying to hold unleashed. back. Unleashed! The griffins would attack before anything would happen though, and the rest was a relatively incident-free journey all the way to Bazaar. There were a few more fights with some families of griffins, but that was because the area they were cutting through was a griffin nesting ground. This provided a pretty good source of food for them, since the younger the griffin, the more tender the meat. They ate a bunch of baby griffins because they're tender? So much so that they had actually chosen to eat the child griffin over the mother or father. Oh, that's fucked up. That's fucked Oh, but hey, I guess that's the food chain, huh? That brings us now to Alina Lise's story about her past, but I think that's something I'll try to include next episode. Oh? So, that's pretty- Alina Lise's past? 
Oh, the argument of why she will never forgive Paul no matter what. I thought it's as simple as uh, Paul and Irina Eze, obviously they got it on, you know, they might have been just fuck buddies. Maybe there's a potential for a true relationship, but then Zenith showed around and Paul started fucking Zenith and Irina Eze felt like she got cheated on or something and she got tossed aside like a side hoe and she felt angry about that. That seems a little bit too level one line of thinking. It's the most intuitive way. It must be something beyond that, right? I doubt Edina Rize, polygamous as she is, would be that upset that Paul would fuck Zenith over Edina Rize. There must be something even worse than that, right? Pretty much everything you missed from this episode, not including the extra two chapters involving the bandit ambush. I hope <laughs> you enjoyed bandits. hearing more about Mishoku Tensei, and if you did, consider leaving a like and subscribing. Y'all know what to do. Please go to... His channel, go like his videos and sub to his channel if he hasn't. He always gives such good breakdowns of what's going on on the stuff that we're watching. But the desert episodes, the adventuring was a breath of fresh air. Finally, we're out of the school. We're getting back on the adventuring mode. And while the battles against the monsters was not the most exciting, because obviously who really gives a fuck about griffins or these different monsters that we can obviously defeat... It was just so refreshing to just change the environment and move forward to this turning point three that they've been setting up for such a long time. So I'm very excited to see what's going to happen in the next episode and the despair that will happen eventually. But that's it from me. See ya.